Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this year's St. Thomas More Lecture. Um, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Professor David Jones from uh, the Anscombe Centre. He's the director of the Anscombe Centre, and he's also a research fellow at Blackfriars, just down the road, and a professor of bioethics at St. Mary's University, Twickenham. And he did his DPhil here in Oxford on the theology of death. And then now he's going to talk to us about Thomas More, uh, John Donne, and uh, assisted dying. So um, just before we start, just to let you all know, um, if you didn't realize already, there will be mass celebrated uh, at 8.30 in the chaplaincy. So the lecture will go on until about uh, eight o'clock or just after. And then there'll be enough time for you to walk over and join us here for mass at 8.30 if you'd like to join us. So Professor Jones, do uh, take it away. So th thank you, thank you very much. The, the topic might seem uh, a little esoteric, but I hope uh, it will all will become clear. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to give a lecture in honor of a man for all seasons, saint, statesman, wit, martyr, and of course, Oxonian. Uh, the focus of this talk is Thomas More, but also his uh, sister's great grandson, uh, the poet John Donne. Um, and when it is done, it might seem less about more and more about Donne, but I will show, try to show that Donne can't really be understood apart from more. So when all is said and done, it will be more about more and less about Donne. Uh, I apologize for indulging in a little wordplay, but it is a work, an echo of a wordplay by John Donne himself Dunn married a girl called Moore, Anne Moore, uh, coincidentally, no relation to Thomas Moore. Uh, it was a clandestine marriage. She was underage and her father didn't give permission. Uh, and Dunn was briefly imprisoned for it. And from prison, he penned the epigram, John Dunn, Anne Dunn, Undone. Uh, and later alluded to it in a poem in which he says to God, when thou hast done, thou hast not done for I have more. But back to Thomas More. Uh, this lecture is about precedent. As a general rule, the more unprecedented a proposal, the keener advocates are to claim that it has precedent of the most unimpeachable kind. Uh, this is a general truth, but is illustrated well by the example of assisted dying, that is voluntary euthanasia and or physician assisted suicide. The word euthanasia in its present usage, meaning the act of deliberately ending someone's life to relieve suffering, was coined in the late 19th century. And indeed, it's only at this time that the idea first emerges. Euthanasia, you might say, is a child of an unhappy marriage between medical innovations in pain relief in the 19th century and contemporary philosophical innovations of utilitarianism, social Darwinism and eugenics. As a legally sanctioned practice, it's even more recent. It emerges in slightly different forms in the Netherlands in the 1980s, in Switzerland and in the state of Oregon in the 1990s. Of course, an idea can be uh, original and good. I am not the kind of traditionalist who thinks that novelty and error are synonyms. Nevertheless, if an idea can be shown to have a precedent, with um, a respected authority or authorities, this is something in its favor, and especially when seeking to persuade a skeptical or a conservative audience. And so advocates of euthanasia and physician assisted suicide have looked back, back past the 19th century uh, and have conscripted a number of Renaissance and early modern writers to their cause. And this purported crowd of witnesses typically includes St. Thomas More, uh, Michel de Montaigne, Francis Bacon, Richard Burton, Robert Burton, sorry, Freudian slip, Robert Burton, the author of Anatomy of Melancholy, and John Donne. But of these, More and Donne have a special place because of their significance for the Christian tradition and national life. Thus, when the Voluntary Euthanasia Legalization Bill 
was first debated in the House of Lords in 1936, Lord Ponsonby of Shalbred invoked both Moore and Dunn. Quote, I need not go back to far centuries to the time of Seneca, but I would like to quote one of the one who wrote a special treatise on the subject in the 17th century. I have mentioned two deans of St Paul's, I'm going to mention another, John Dunn, who was in St Paul's from 1621 to 1631. He said, quote, quote within a quote, um, since I may without flying or eating when I have the means attend an executioner or a famine, and since I may offer my life uh, even for another's temporal good, and since I must do it for his spiritual good, and since I may give another my hoard in a shipwreck and so drown, and since I may hasten my arrival to heaven by consuming penances, it is a wayward and unnoble stubbornness in argument to say, still I must not kill myself, but I may let myself die. So that's Ponsonby quoting Dunn. And then later Ponsonby says that he would like to say, quote, to those who are adopting the Catholic position, that a very notable Catholic, so notable that he has recently been canonized, the year before, uh, 1935, Sir Thomas More, now Saint Thomas More, said in his Utopia, quote, if the disease be not incurable, but also full of continual pain and anguish, then the priests and the magistrates exhort the man, seeing that he is not able to do any duty in life, and by overliving his own death, is noisome and irksome to others and grievous to himself. And that he will determine with himself no longer to cherish this pestilent and painful disease. And seeing that his life is to him but a torment, he will not be unwilling to die, but rather will take good hope either to dispatch himself out of this painful life as out of a prison, or else uh, suffer someone else to, to uh, rid it of him. Uh, in so doing, they will tell him he shall do wisely, seeing that by his death he shall lose no commodity, but end his pain. This very eloquent plea, I'm still Lord Ponsonby at this point, um, has, to be, has been interpreted by some as meaning Sir Thomas More did not agree with it. There is no shred of evidence to show that this was not what he considered to be the ideal when he wrote his Utopia. Later, I will indeed offer some shreds of evidence that Thomas More did not consider suicide or euthanasia to be the ideal when he wrote his Utopia. But first, it is worth emphasizing that Lord Ponsonby was, not, was by no means alone in invoking More and Dunn in favor of euthanasia and assisted suicide. The Voluntary Euthanasia Legalization Bill was thrown out in 1936. But in 1950, the topic was raised again in the House of Lords, this time by Lord Chorley, whose motion asked the government to consider introducing a euthanasia bill. In this context, Lord Chorley again appealed to Thomas More. Quote, Although some classical philosophers like Epictetus and Seneca affirmed the right of a man who is suffering intense pain from an incurable illness to take his own life, so far as I am aware, euthanasia, in the sense of a community-sanctioned taking of life, was first advocated by Sir Thomas More in the pages of his famous book, Utopia. Lord Chorley's motion was defeated, and it was not until 2004 that the House of Lords next considered a bill to legalise euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. A select committee was established to consider Lord Joffey's assisted dying for the terminally ill bill. Amongst the evidence received by this committee was a memorandum from the Swiss organization Dignitas, which had been founded in 1998 to, quote, assist people to obtain a pain-free suicide, unquote. That memorandum, the Memorandum of Dignitas, ended with an appeal to the authority 
of Thomas More. Quote, Therefore, dignitas would be grateful if the British legislator would approach the Swiss model. Dignitas is, in this respect, very near to one of the most brilliant British philosophers of all time, Thomas More, who in his famous Utopia said as early as 1517, and then Dignitas proceeds to quote the same passage as Lord Chorley quoted in 1950 and Lord Ponsonby in 1936. Outside parliamentary discussion, invoking More and Dunn, as by advocates of euthanasia and assisted suicide is similarly ubiquitous. It's found in a pamphlet of the late 19th century, continues throughout uh, the 20th century, and, and is repeated up to the present day in popular internet sites. Thus, Wikipedia, in its entry on voluntary euthanasia, states that, quote, in the 16th century, Thomas More, considered a saint by Roman Catholics, described a utopian community and envisaged such a community as one that would facilitate the death of those whose lives had become burdensome as a result of torturing, torturing and lingering pain. Uh, this passage is lifted almost word for word, though with acknowledgement, from an article on voluntary euthanasia in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, also available online by the philosopher Robert Young. This in turn is taken from Young's earlier monograph, Medically Assisted Death, where he expands a little on it as follows. Individual thinkers within these traditions of Judeo-Christian and Islamic thought have sometimes challenged the supposed immorality of suicide. For example, in the 16th century, Thomas More envisaged a utopian community that would facilitate the death of those whose lives had become burdensome as a result of torturing and lingering pain. Some modern scholars have claimed that More's use of irony means that he cannot be taken as having endorsed assisted dying. According to their reading, Book Two of Utopia ridicules it. Others acknowledge its ironic temper, but believe Utopia shows Christian humanism's most attractive face and expresses qualified admiration for many of the practices it describes. Young then immediately moves from Moore to Dunn. John Dunn's defense of suicide in the book Beer Thanatos was more straightforward, but despite being prepared to countenance it in a narrow range of circumstances, he was not willing to have the work, which was originally written in 1606, published until after his death. To return to the Wikipedia page, which is a useful reference point, not so much for what is true, but for what is widely supposed to be true, it provides a second source for Thomas More on euthanasia, which is Derek Humphrey and Anne Wickett's book, uh, the Right to Die, Understanding Euthanasia, published in 1986. Humphrey and Wicket make the same reference to More's Utopia as follows. In 1516, Sir Thomas More's Utopia was published. It depicted an ideal society in which voluntary euthanasia was officially sanctioned. Uh, Humphrey and Wicket then quote that passage as quoted by Ponsonby and Chorley and Dignitas, and then, after mention of Francis Bacon, they turn their attention to Dunn. Quote, in 1647, John Dunn, in Beer Thanatos, argued in favour of suicide as a form of voluntary euthanasia. The taking of one's life, he insisted, is not incompatible with the laws of nature, of reason, or of God. This same story is told by the Right Reverend Alistair Haggard, addressing a local meeting of the Voluntary Euthanasia Society in Edinburgh in 1991. Quote, in Christian history, the person who first clearly formulated what is regarded as the usual orthodox attitude towards suicide is Saint Augustine. He set the pattern which continued for many centuries, continuing through the, the Reformation too. There were a few exceptions. Thomas More's Utopia, included euthanasia. So did Bacon in New Atlantis. John Donne, who was Dean of St Paul's, London in the 17th century, 
wrote a pamphlet called Via Thanatos, which is subtitled, quote, a declaration of that paradox or thesis that self-homicide is not so naturally sin that it might never be otherwise. Young, Humphrey, Wicketts and Haggard all write as advocates of assisted dying. But a similar account is given by Kenneth Boyd, who while ambivalent is certainly no zealot for the cause, and whose account occurs in a book edited by that most acute of critics of euthanasia, John Keown. According to Boyd, Hume was not the first to question the traditional Christian condemnation and consequent criminalization of suicide. This was done in earlier centuries by two of the greatest glories of the English church, St. Thomas More, by implication, in the not unfavorable account of euthanasia in his Utopia, and John Donne, much more directly, using arguments similar to Hume's in his Via Thanatos. I apologize for laboring the point, but sometimes it is necessary to show that there is a case that needs answering before turning to answer it. But in summary, it is frequently, frequently stated that Thomas More advocated euthanasia in his book Utopia, and that John Donne defended suicide in his book Via Thanatos. And thus that these two glories of the English church provide precedent for Christian approval of assisted dying. What then are we to make of these claims? So let us turn first to More. The first point to make is that while More coined the term utopia, the word utopia, it has come to mean something rather different than it meant originally. As people now use the word, a utopian society is an ideal society, a perfect society. The word indeed sounds like it means a good place, a utopos, like the word euphonium or eulogy or eugenics or indeed euthanasia. However, there is no E in utopia. The word is not derived from utopos, good place, but from utopos, no place. The confusion is of course deliberate, a typical piece of Moore's wit, and raises the question of how far this no place is a good place. But the answer to that question from Moore's point of view is very clearly good in parts. Moore sought to imagine a pagan society that was seeking the good and what that might be like, but he actually believed in a world which was both better and worse than that, a world of grace and sin, a world in which Christ died, but where the devil still prowls for the ruin of souls. This alters what is ideal. Indeed, some of the customs of the utopians were clearly ones that Moore rejected. They practiced divorce. Moore died rather than approve of the divorce of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. The utopians tolerate different religions, whereas Moore thought the state should promote and protect the Christian religion. The utopians actively encouraged suicide when a person was no more used to society, where it is, whereas it is very clear, even at the time that Moore was writing Utopia, that he regarded suicide as an act of despair and as a temptation from the devil. At this point, I should say that some who uh, are listening may have been affected or may be affected by suicide. They may know someone who has taken their life. They may be struggling about how to go on. And if so, I would urge you now not to keep this to yourself, but to express it and seek help. You do not have to struggle alone. There are there, there are people there for you. The historian Paul Green has set out Moore's concern for people who had taken their lives or who are tempted to. There was a man, Richard Hun, whose child had died in infancy and who got into a dispute with the parish priest about death duty. He was then accused by the priest of heresy 
and imprisoned. And while in prison, he took his own life. Uh, this happened before Moore wrote Utopia. And Moore knew of the case and commented on it and was quite moved by it, according on Green's account. And for this reason, he avoided sending others to the bishop's prison, lest the same should happen to them. There is another account um, uh, that Moore met a man from Winchester who was prone to bouts of despair and thoughts of suicide. Moore talked with him, counseled him, prayed for him. And while the man was able to come and talk to Moore, he kept his spirits up. However, when Moore was imprisoned and awaiting execution, the man despaired and was again overcome with suicidal thoughts. So, as Moore was being taken to the scaffold, um, the man pushed past the guards to speak to Moore, and the conversation was recorded and reported as follows. Mr. Moore, do you know me? I pray you for the Lord's sake, help me. I am as ill troubled as I ever was. St. Thomas answered, Sir Thomas answered, I remember thee full well. Go thy ways in peace and pray for me, and I will not fail to pray for thee. And from that time, so long as he lived, he was never troubled in that manner of temptation. While in prison, awaiting execution, Moore wrote a dialogue of comfort against tribulation, which contains an extended discussion of suicide on why it should not be lauded or romanticized or thought noble, and of how temptation to suicide should be resisted. The prevention of suicide may involve not only seeking out wise and spiritual counsel, but also availing oneself of the help of the physician, who by diet or medicines or purgatives might temper the melancholy humours. Moore's attitude to suicide is seen most clearly in the dialogue to comfort, but it is consistent throughout his life and is shown both in his writings and in his dealings with others. Moore's own view of suicide is also presented in Utopia, but not in the Utopian's practice of euthanasia and encouragement to suicide, but in book one of Utopia, why Hith where Hithlerday, who's the protagonist, attacks the unjust laws of England by which even petty thieves are put to death. Quote, For God, having taken from us the right of disposing either of our own or of other people's lives, if it is pretended that the mutual consent of men in making laws can authorise manslaughter in cases in which God has given us no example, that it frees people from the obligation of the divine law and so makes murder a lawful action. What is this but to give preference to human laws before the divine? Thomas More does indeed imagine an island, the inhabitants of which encourage suicide and practice euthanasia. But this island is not an ideal world and these practices are not ones that he advocates. He took such actions as to be as being contrary to the to the divine law. So, if Moore was not a defender of euthanasia, and he was not, was Dunn at least a defender of suicide, for he did indeed write this book, Euthan uh, on um, entitled *Be a Thanatos*, which was subtitled "Declaration of that paradox or thesis that self-homicide is not so naturally sin." that it may never be otherwise, wherein the nature and extent of all those laws that seem to be violated by the act are diligently surveyed. This book is almost universally described as a defense of suicide, and it is often compared with the treatise of David Hume on suicide, which is indeed such a defense. However, with Dunn's book, as with Moore's, the first question to ask is what kind of book is this? It describes itself as a paradox. And this has led to comparison with an earlier work of Dunn, Paradoxes and Problems, which is a collection of witty and deliberately con contrary defenses of paradoxical theses. 
that work includes such theses as that all things kill themselves, that it is possible to find some virtue in some women, that nature is our worst guide, that only cowards dare die, and that the gifts of the body are better than those of the mind. Via Thanatos is altogether a more serious work, but it does at times stray into that provocatively perverse reasoning of the young Jack Dunn. The book implies, though it doesn't quite say in so many words, that Jesus' death was a kind of self-homicide. Well, it leaves open the possibility that the death of Judas was meritorious and even a kind of martyrdom. This is beyond paradox. It is an underestimate to say, as he does in a cover letter, that the book is misinterpretable. It is all too easy, uh, though ultimately I think it is mistaken, to regard it as a defense of suicide. In that accompanying letter, he asks, let any that your discretion admits to the sight of it know the date of it that this book is written by Jack Dunn and not by Dr. Dunn. Reserve it for me if I live, and if I die, only forbid it to the press or the fire. Publish it not, yet burn it not, and between those two, do what you will with it. It is true that David Hume's book on suicide was also published posthumously, but the reason was different. Hume feared to publish lest it harm his reputation, whereas Dunn feared that people might be misled by the book into attempting or promoting suicide. There is admittedly a similarity to Hume in some of the arguments that are used, principally those that seek to argue against Thomas Aquinas's account of suicide. However, while Hume argues against Aquinas to make way to a doctrine close to the Stoics, Dunn is rather interested in what it is to lay down one's life as Christ laid down his life. He regards voluntary death as justified not to escape the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as a contemporary of his once said, but only as a means to give glory to God. What he defends is not suicide as ordinarily understood, but is martyrdom. In relation to suicide as the term is ordinarily understood, or euthanasia as envisaged by Moore, he is as strongly opposed as Augustine or Aquinas. It is true that he reserves judgment on the conscience of someone who takes their own life, but he considers the path of avoiding sin in such a case to be, quote, obscure and steepy and slippery and narrow and every error deadly. Public approval of suicide cannot but be a slippery slope. It is not an action to be encouraged or assisted. Same time as Pseudo Marta, a book that Dunn wrote to persuade Catholics that they could in good conscience take the oath of allegiance to James I. Pseudomata is fiercely critical of the Jesuits, whom Dunn accuses of encouraging an inordinate affection for martyrdom. True martyrdom does not seek out danger, but accepts death only when it is necessary. The martyr bears witness to the truth for which he or she dies. Dunn's complaint is that the Catholic martyrs of the Reformation, at least of his own day, were dying not for a central doctrine of the faith, but for the most speculative of doctrines, the power of popes to exercise secular authority by deposing princes. Furthermore, Catholics were persecuted because they could no longer be trusted to be loyal to the crown. And the reason they could no longer be trusted was precisely because the Pope had released them from their oath of obedience to the sovereign. They thus suffered needlessly in Dunn's view, and they died not as martyrs, but as pseudo-martyrs. In some way, the book Pseudo-Martyr is a merit uh, and a compliment to Beathanatos, Thanatos, 
One is about what appears to be martyrdom, but is vitiated by an inordinate love of death. The other is about what seems to be suicide, but is redeemed by a love of God. The natural love of life is corrupted by sin, not only through inordinate love of life, but also through inordinate love of death. And in both cases, it is redeemed by a graced willingness, either to live as and for Christ, or to die as and for Christ. Nevertheless, the dangers in Beathanatos and Pseudomata are not equal. Dunn is happy publicly to discourage what he regards as false martyrdom. He is unwilling publicly to encourage anything which might appear to be suicide. To gain a deeper understanding of Dunn and to see what he is trying to achieve in these two books, it's necessary to know some of his background and family. One of the most well-known, though most controversial, uh, biographies of John Donne begins with the line, the first thing to remember about Donne is that he was a Catholic. The second is that he betrayed his faith. It is true that Donne was an apostate, brought up in a faithful, Catholic, recusant family, but embracing the established church in his early 20s. It is also true that he was ambitious and sought patronage from Protestant nobles and from James I, and that he was rewarded ultimately with the appointment of uh, D as Dean of St. Paul's, perhaps the most political of pulpits. He took the king's shilling, we might say, and he benefited from it. Nevertheless, while Dunn was perhaps a wayward Catholic, he did not abandon his faith so much that it was not active in him. He struggled much with his conscience. And if he did not suffer physically for his faith, as his family did, he suffered at least for that honest human love of his wife, the love for which he lost his career and lived in poverty and saw five of his 12 children die. And his wife died not long after he finally established a steady income by accepting ordination as an Anglican cleric. He cared for his family. At the beginning of Pseudomata, Dunn claims that, quote, I have been ever awake in the meditation of martyrdom by being derived from such a stock and race as I believe no family that is not far larger in extent and greater in branches hath endured and suffered much more in their persons and fortunes for obeying the teachers of Roman doctrine than it, it, than it had. I did not therefore enter into this as a carnal or overindulgent favor of, favorer of this life, but out of such reasons as may uh, arise uh, uh, when you are pleased to read this whole work. Dunn's extended family certainly faced persecution. Two uncles were Jesuits who died in exile, one of whom, Jasper Haywood, was a classical scholar at Oxford and translated Seneca's plays. Dunn's elder brother, Henry, died in prison of the plague. He was in prison for sheltering a Catholic priest. Soon after this occurred, Dunn's mother, who remained faithful to the Catholic religion, fled into exile with her husband. Behind these contemporary examples is the towering figure of Thomas More. John Donne was the great grandson of Elizabeth More, Thomas More's sister. If this seems a distant relation, consider Donne's mother. She was born in the early 1540s, only a few years after the execution of Thomas More. She would have known More's children and his ne nephews and nieces. When Dunn's mother returned from exile and was widowed a third time, she moved into the deanery with her son. Indeed, he only outlived her by three months or so. There is a story that the old woman brought with her into that house, the head of Thomas More, which she hid under the bed. This is almost certainly apocryphal, 
as Moore's head was rescued from the pike by uh, his eldest daughter, Margaret Roper, Meg, and was buried uh, in the crypt of the Roper, Roper Chapel. Nevertheless, the story serves to illustrate how the presence of Thomas More remained with Dunn, even to his last days, and not least in the person of his mother, the faithful Catholic. In Beathanatos, Dunn describes More as, quote, a man of the most tender and delicate conscience that the world saw since St. Augustine. And in Pseudomata, while he relentlessly criticizes the Jesuits, he cannot criticize more, but refers to him of whose firmness in the integrity of the Roman faith, that church need not be ashamed. Tender, conscience, firmness, integrity. It is possible to think of Dunn as trading on his family's recusant credentials while at the same time decrying the faith for which they suffered and he did not. However, I think this would be unduly harsh. The aim of pseudo martyr is to persuade Catholics that on Catholic principles, it is possible to swear the oath of allegiance in good conscience. This of course benefits the crown, but it would also alleviate the situation of those recusants of his own family. On, on his own account, which I do not think that we should dismiss, it is the activities of the Jesuits and the misencouragement of unnecessary sacrifice of life that John found most objectionable. His apostasy seems to have occurred in that period immediately after the death of his brother. And it is possible to see this as the catalyst for John's alienation from the faith to which the rest of his family adhered. After this, he became a soldier of fortune, uh, fighting the Spanish with Walter Raleigh while he penned clever, erotic verses. And he sought a religion which was Christian but was not aligned to Rome, but neither at this point to any other anchor. He did not become a Protestant by conviction, not anyhow to begin with, but gradually conformed to those around him having severed links with a way of being Christian that seemed to him a cruelly wasteful, a cruel waste of human life and too easily in love with death. If martyrdom is the, hi the highest form of courage, as Aquinas argues, pseudo-martyrdom is the expression of a vice of rashness. And it was against this that Dunn fundamentally rebelled. On this account, both Beathanatos and Pseudomata are deeply personal books in which Dunn is arguing with himself. While Thomas More died as a martyr in defiance of the king and Dunn became the king's apologist, there are nevertheless points of contact. Thomas More was certainly not an excitable or inordinate lover of martyrdom of the kind that Dunn criticised but he sought to avoid execution while he could by discretion. And even while, while Moore refused to take the oath of supremacy, he remained reticent about his reasons and appealed to conscience. This may have been to spare the consciences of others who in their ignorance were happy to swear the oath and whom Moore was wary of, being, of putting in danger before his own courage was tested. While Dunn's conscience might seem a little more convenient to him, his criticism of a distorted cult of martyrdom among the recusants of his own generation was, I believe, heartfelt. Dunn also suffered from melancholy. Excuse me. And it is this that gives him a great sympathy for those who take their own lives. I often have such a sickly inclination, he writes, which has won me to a charitable interpretation of their action who die so, and not pronounce peremptory judgments on them. Thou knowest this man's fall, but thou knowest not his wrestling. 
which perchance was such that almost his very fall is justified and accepted of God. For to this end, it is said, God has appointed us temptations that we might have some excuses for our sins when he calls us to account. Dunn held out hope that God might accept the soul of one who died so. This was not because he thought that suicide, in the ordinary meaning of the term, was a good or noble death to be encouraged. He does have an account of a noble death, uh, to the glory of God, a happy death. But he also has a sense that even an unhappy death might still be accepted by God. It is a fall, but God and only God knows the circumstances of the fall and how the person wrestled before he fell. Dunn here, I think, anticipates the development of Catholic doctrine, which while, while remaining steadfast in valuing every person's life, holds out the hope that God can save even those who die badly. Thus, the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, we should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. I'll say that again. We should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways known to him alone, God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. The church prays for persons who have taken their own lives. There is thus in the work of, and I am coming close to the end of people who are worried about uh, getting to Mass. There is thus in the work of Moore and of Dunn, and in some others of the time, perhaps most notably Robert Burton, the anatomy of melancholy, a concern for those who are so afflicted by melancholy and by the circumstances of their life that they seek to end it. What there is not is an affirmation that somehow things would be better if there was a community sanctioned, organized and promoted form of euthanasia or assisted suicide. That would in fact amount precisely to the misencouragement of death against which Dunn railed. There is no precedent from Moore or Dunn for assisted dying. What is there instead then? In place of seeking death by one's own hand or on request by the hand of another, both Moore and Dunn enjoined an acceptance of death, howsoever it should come, as a return to God and as a trial that is common to all humanity. It is indeed in this solidarity that we have in death that we see why suicide, assisted or unassisted, cannot be a matter of indifference or leave us unaffected. It affects us all. This was something more understood as he awaited execution and he expressed it in a dialogue of comfort against tribulation. And it was something that Dunn understood too and expressed during his final illness in perhaps the most famous and I think most Catholic of his meditations with which I end. Perchance he for whom the bell tolls may be so ill that he knows not it tolls for him. And perchance I might think myself better than I am and as those about me are and my state may have caused it to toll for me, and yet I know not. The church is Catholic, universal, and so are her actions. All that she does belongs to all. When she baptizes a child, this action concerns me, for that child is thereby connected to that head which is my head too, and engrafted into that body whereof I am a member. And when she buries a man, that action concerns me. All mankind is of one author and is of one volume. And when a man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but is translated to a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. And God employs several translators. Some pieces are translated by age, 
some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation, and his hand shall bind up the scattered leaves again for that library when every book shall be opened to one another. As therefore the bell that rings to the sermon calls not only the preacher, but the whole congregation to come, so this bell calls us all. But how much more me, who am brought so near the door by this sickness? Who bends not his ear to any bell upon which occasion rings, but who can remove it from the bell, which is the passing a piece of himself out of this world? No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a, a piece of the continent, a part of the main, a clod. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, or as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, that was a fantastic lecture. So um, now uh, we've got just a bit of time for some questions. So if people have any questions, then please drop them in the comment box on the YouTube stream and then I'll uh, be able to pass them on. Uh, so just to kick things off, um, uh, you mentioned sort of euthanasia as a slippery slope briefly. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a bit more perhaps on um, uh, more, more, but you're both more and done of um, how we might apply that given we've seen uh, examples from, say, the Netherlands, where you could say it has quite clearly become a slippery slope. So, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, I I brought up that the slippery slope is a is a is a form of argument, and it's an argument which is applied particularly to euthanasia, because in those countries which have legalised euthanasia or physician assisted suicide, we have seen the expansion of the practice, the expansion in numbers, the expansion on in terms of who it applies to, and we've seen the erosion of uh, those uh, safeguards or purported safeguards. Um, uh, and so, as Dunn used the phrase slippery, um, I thought um, it, would be, it would be useful, but uh, he's, um, uh, he's using it in a slightly more a different way. He thinks his own logic is slippery. He thinks that thinking about uh, suicide in the way that he is thinking about it is really easily prone to error and and easily prone to make people think that suicide is something which could be commended and that he thinks will be a dreadful and deadly error so he's he's sort of arguing against himself and it's for that reason that he doesn't want the book published but perhaps you could also say that the logic of euthanasia itself is is slippery in that way. It's not just the application. There's something which is slippery about this logic that um, uh, some people can be judged better off dead. Great, thank you. Um, so Anna asks, uh, do you think the loss of the Christian idea of redemptive suffering is what has led to increased acceptance of euthanasia and can we combat euthanasia without an appeal to it? Um, yes, it's, it is difficult to know. Um, uh, euthanasia emerges in the, in, the, in the late 19th century, as I say, and, and it does seem to be encouraged. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, never has there been um, more knowledge of of uh, pain relieving drugs at the end of life. Never have we been able to palliate uh, the suffering at the end of life more than we have now, and yet uh, never has there been such a clamour to to have uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia as we have now. Um, but I think uh, Dunn would be uh, hesitant about um, you might say the opposite kind of da danger, which is a sort of romanticizing of suffering. 
um, uh, there will be there will be suffering enough to go round, um, and there are things that we can learn from our suffering. And if we don't think that we can learn from our suffering, then and then certainly it's it's harder to face. Uh, but there can also be a, a kind of um, uh, almost a perverse um, encouragement of suffering, uh, and that that has sometimes occurred in the Christian tradition, and that has put people off very much the Christian tradition. So we have to be very careful how we think about um, uh, how we talk about suffering and and uh, a way of giving suffering meaning. Uh, you're mute. Nightmare, right. Well, oh well. <laughs> so uh, Alex is asking, um, uh, you touched on Don's view of, uh, Don's view of martyrdom. Uh, what value do you think St. Thomas More's martyrdom as proto-martyr of Oxford has in looking at assisted suicide, especially in light of the claim most notably made by Chesterton in Orthodoxy that martyrdom and suicide are in fact polar opposites? Uh, yeah, did, 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 did uh, um, Cheston say that? I didn't, I'd forgotten that Cheston said that. I know Herbert McCabe, who also uh, uh, taught for many years in, in Oxford, uh, once said that uh, everyone dies either by suicide or by martyrdom, um, by which uh, he meant either by making of one's death a kind of self-assertion or by handing oneself over in death. Um, Yes, I think that Moore has something to offer, and I think that Moore, in in uh, a, 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 the dialogue of comfort against tribulation, definitely does. Um, and the fact that he was he was so prominent in the world, he was so prominent in Oxford and in the world. It, it's not it's not just that he he accepted martyrdom as as someone who was a sort of an unhappy or marginal figure. He he accepted martyrdom as someone who. Uh, you know who was Chancellor? And we think of uh, who's uh, it's Rishi at the moment. I mean, so I mean, who? If you think of of that someone who is at the top of national public life decides that uh, there is something which is so important in their life and and in terms of integrity that they would die for it. That's I mean, deeply was deeply shocking, and and he remains, I think. Um, uh, an, imp an important figure about trying to to give yeah f f find mean find meaning in tribulation because I think notwithstanding what I said to the, to the previous question I think that we we do need to find uh, meaning and we do need to look to examples that we can be uh, inspired by, and and Thomas More is is one such example, which is another reason why I think it it's such a travesty to to invoke him in favour of euthanasia, um, uh, uh, as I hope I have illustrated. Great, thanks. Um, so Pius asks, um, given Don, uh, given Don's strong stand against assisted dying as well as common ground between uh, Moore and the Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions. To what extent can interfaith and ecumenical dialogue be useful in changing policy in a rapidly secularizing age? So there is a tendency um, in talking about euthanasia and public policy not to talk about religion. I mean, there's an irony that it, it tends to be the people who are in favour of euthanasia who invoke um, uh, religion who, uh, in order to say, oh, there's these religious figures who are in favour of it, whereas re religious people are wary in case uh, it, it is thought that if they invoke religion, then uh, it isn't relevant to people who are not religious. Um, and I think... Um, there are good there are practical reasons why people do this um and uh reasons which are specifically christian and um abrahamic you might say um uh, won't appeal to everyone but i think for those who are christian uh, or for those who have a faith in god that comes through a revelation 
uh, uh, and uh, which which is traced back to Abraham. I think um, those arguments can be more powerful. Um, so it isn't that you will persuade more people by this, and it is perhaps the case that one should be careful when when one uses these kind of arguments. But I do think for those who are Christian, we should think what is our view of the world and what is our view of death and um, not just for our own sake but for everyone's sake um, and that we find some explicit theological reflection on these things and we don't just rely on slippery slope arguments oh if you do this then uh, it will end badly um, uh, those arguments have their usefulness but I think that it's good also to, to, to look at the deeper question of um, how we think we should approach death, our own death. I mean. um, and then uh, Charlie is asking uh, whether you have any thoughts on last year's ruling in favour of the right to die by Germany's constitutional court. Um, I, was, I was talking to... Um, a uh, German Jesuit, actually, not all Jesuits about whatever Dunn might say, um, who thought that it was um, the worst decision that the Constitutional Court had ever made. Um, uh, I uh, am um, not so knowledgeable about other decisions to be able to say that confidently, but it is a dreadful decision. It is a really, really dreadful decision. Um, it overturns a law from uh, 2015, which was quite a modest law. Um, it was the, the, the law in Germany had not said anything about suicide um, in relation to, to illegality. And they didn't uh, prohibit all forms of assisting suicide as uh, England does. But they only prohibited organized forms of assisted dying, of, of uh, assisted suicide rather. So they were, the, and, and the reason they, were, they, they, they did so is to try to stop the encroachment of um, uh, uh, Exit Deutsche Swiss, the German-speaking Swiss organization into Germany, setting up shops there. So they just said, this shouldn't be organized and advertised. So we're not saying that it can never happen, but we don't want to have organizations offering this. So it was quite a modest judgment. And the Constitutional Court said, it, essentially, people have uh, that suicide is something people have a right to. Um, and that you interfere with that right if you don't allow organizations to offer it, which is just wrong on so many levels. Um, but um, uh, um, happily, it's not a, a, a judgment which has been followed in the English courts. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, that's been uh, some fantastic questions there as well. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been great to have you here with us, or you know, online if not in person. And uh, just.